Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is a tag video. This is the Life Story Tags uh, which was originated by uh, Book Time with Elvis. And it's a tag about, uh, as it, the name Life Stories implies, biographies and autobiographies. And regular viewers to my channel may be surprised that I'm going to attempt this tag because I don't really read uh, biographies and autobiographies although in thinking you know reading the prompts and then thinking about it I've read more than I was kind of aware of so uh, let's see where we get to I think it, this is going to be a slightly uh, uh, outlier take on on sort of biography and autobiography and memoir Question one, do you have a preference for biography or autobiography? Uh, my preference is actually not to read them at all, either of them. Um, and I'm going to explain why. So this is a book called Henry's Demons, by uh, it's Living with Schizophrenia, by a father and son, uh, Patrick and Henry Coburn. Henry, the son, has schizophrenia. They get alternate chapters in here, Henry writing about it and his father writing about it. They don't necessarily um, coincide in, sort of, uh, in terms of sort of chronology and stuff but obviously the father is a, is a carer and Henry is trying to um, you know delineate the nature of, of how schizophrenia affects him and his you know his attitude towards it and it's perfectly well written but I didn't learn anything about it nothing significant and then we come to a book here uh, The Octopus Man a novel by Jasper Gibson um, published this this year I, I think or maybe late last year I gave it five stars I thought it was superb it's about schizophrenia I will post the link to my review of it I learned far more about schizophrenia from this novel than I did from this non-fiction and that's what I feel I feel that the something about the function of the novel you know allows greater insight and I would always go to a novel first over a memoir or, or a biography on a particular sort of theme or subject uh, or and again is this is this autobiography or is this fiction this is called The Years by Annie Erno and it's ostensibly her autobiography um, but it's told as the autobiography of the country France in which she uh, was born grew, grew up in and only indirectly is her life filtered through that. It's really about the biography of France and all the different social trends from the end of the Second World War to the turn of the 21st century. And it's brilliant. Again, another five star read for me. I would dub this as fiction uh, because it's, it's, you know, the, it wears its artifice very, very openly because the artifice is this is a biography about France and a sub-autobiography about uh, one of its citizens called Annie Erno. Um, and I think the artifice means that it's, it is definitely fiction for me. Others might disagree. OK, two. Do you gravitate towards a specific area like sport, celebrity or history, etc.? Well, the first thing is I would never, ever read a celebrity. I, I'm not interested in celebrities. I find most of them completely vacuous. Famous for, for being famous. Uh, history, unfortunately, is closed off to me because my degree was in history, or half of my degree was in history. And I got so alienated with the subject that I, I actually changed uh, my degree to social and political studies, which is far more nourishing, I felt. Uh, so I don't read history, although I have a very good grounding in it because, you know, my, my, my reading in history at school and stuff was good enough to get me to university to study it. Um, but no, I don't, I don't read history books. And as you know, I don't read historical fiction for much the same reason. Again, I'll post a link to my review of Lauren Binet's uh, novel HHHH, which sort of goes into a lot of my feelings about both history and historical fiction. And sport. Um, no, I'm not, I'm not really interested in, in uh, the mental side of uh, sport I mean I'm a big sports fan but I'm only interested in their performance out on the pitch or the field I'm not really interested in what they get up to and what they think about uh, off the field I just want them to do their job to the best of their ability I don't care if they're good boys and girls living a clean dedicated professional life off the field or if they're you know drug toking you know sex fiends as long as they they produce it out there on the field and i have no desire to to know and inquire into what they get up to off the field i did watch the michael jordan documentary in lockdown because there was not much else to do at that time early days of lockdown 
and I found myself disliking the man intensely and I'm not particularly I mean I wasn't I'm not a basketball fan I wasn't you know I'm not particularly you know the Chicago Bulls I actually thought a couple of his teammates in Dennis Rodman and, and Corey Pippin were much more interesting came out through than the, the Jordan I mean I did I did respect Jordan's absolute dedication to winning but um, yeah so no I don't read I don't read sports biographies I, I noticed with interest, uh, noted with interest that Guilty Feet reads cricket biographies. Uh, I do like cricket. I was a bigger fan in my youth than I am now. Um, I, I, I can't imagine what a cricket biography would look like, really. So I'm quite intrigued. I quite hope one day he expands by talking about a specific, a specific cricket biography that he's read. The one subject I have tried to read in is music, popular music. Um, and I find it universally disappointing. I think musicians don't make great writers, even if they're ghostwritten. Uh, they're great musicians, but they're not great writers. And this got me thinking, because if you're dealing with an artist of any kind, a lot of the inquiry naturally will fall into where does their creativity come from or what is the nature of their creativity? which is a notoriously hard thing to analyse and dissect. I read Anthony Storr's book on creativity, and he's a psychoanalyst, and got very little out of that book. And I think that's the point. It's very hard to pinpoint and write out what makes an artist creative. And, you know, I've read, I don't read many literary biographies. I've read one on Jeanette Winterson, or well, it's an autobiography in her case, one on William Burroughs, and one on Franz Kafka. And... Um, Burroughs and Kafka, we've had all three of them being amongst my, my favourite authors. And I enjoyed, I enjoyed the Burroughs one for the information it gave me about his life, but it didn't explain where he his writing comes from. It tried to. It said everything came down to the accidental shooting of his wife in Mexico City and that he was forever um, haunted by that. I don't believe that. Um... So I disagreed with the thesis of where Burroughs' creativity came from. The the best biography of Kafka I've read is by an Italian author called Pietro Citati. And it it was slightly sort of off kilter. It was very enjoyable because Kafka is, as a, as a person, as a character, was so off kilter. And I think Citati honoured that by his presentation. He doesn't directly sort of say, oh, this, this, will, this will explain why he wrote about that or in that fashion. It's there between the lines without Citati ever spelling it out for you. So it's good because it doesn't sort of, you know, throw, thrust it in your face as to where Kafka's creativity came from. And the Jeanette Winterson I'll talk about in, a, in another prompt. So I don't really see the point of reading about great artists. If you're interested, if you're interested in, in the facts of their life, then yeah, absolutely. As with the Burroughs, who lived an interesting life. But if you're after reading biographies to try and get to the, the creative core of them, I think that's a wasted endeavour, quite honestly. Uh, three. Ha oh, I ought to say that uh, the way I get more information about favourite musicians is watching documentaries on YouTube. Uh, so there's, there's lots of them for the bands I like. And last week I watched one on the band Slint, who was sort of one album wonder, really. Uh, but very interesting because I knew that, you know, there, there's an aura of mystery around them and, and, and this, this sort of laid out exactly, you know, where they came from. I didn't realize how young they all were. Um, so, yeah, that, I got a lot out of that in a way. Not, I have no idea if there are any biographies of the band Slint. Um, but I feel I've got all I need to know from that, that documentary film. Three, have you ever read the life story of someone and in doing so changed your opinion on, of them for better or for worse? Yeah, a couple for better. So the first is, it's not, it's not a life biography. It's about uh, a year of insomnia that suffered by the author Samantha Harvey called The Shapeless Unease. And I read a book of hers, uh, a novel, uh, and I didn't like it. Um, but because this is insomnia and that's, that's one of my wheelhouses... Uh, I picked it up and it changed my opinion of her as a writer because this is a superb book. You won't learn a lot about insomnia or get a lot of things feedback into your own insomnia. But it's so literary how she treats that year of her life. The relationship between writing, insomnia and her relationships and her energy levels. So it changed my, you know, I would be prepared 
to give her novels another go. The problem is her most famous novel is historical fiction. So I'm waiting for her next novel. <laughs> Let's see what it is. And uh, But, you know, this was a five-star read. And I've forgotten to get the other one out. Hang on a second. So this is the other one. It, do <laughs> it doesn't necessarily change my view of them because the Beastie Boys are one of my favourite all-time music groups. This book was written by the two surviving members after the third died at the age of 49 from cancer. And you can feel the, 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 you know, the band spit up straight away because they couldn't carry on without, without one of the, the, their limbs. And you can feel the, the gaping loss at the heart of it. But what, what this book does is, you know, they were basically, when they first started out, they were brattish. I'd almost say they were frat boys, except they weren't university based. You know, they had women dancing in cages on stage. They would throw beer everywhere and stuff. I mean, real, you know, pretty reprehensible uh, behaviour. And this book traces their story, and really it's, it traces the story of them growing up in public, really. And from that sort of frat boy mentality, they all uh, move towards uh, marrying very strong creative women in their own right. One was a film director, uh, one of their wives, the other was uh, another musician, etc., uh, etc. Et this is the book about three boys growing up, maturing, and uh, so, again, it's like, for me, it's like with sports people. I don't really care what they're like off stage or out of the recording studio. But actually, I did by reading this. And it's also well put together. It's quite, for a biography or an autobiography, it's very creative in its approach. They have, you know, lots of different people writing chapters. Um, it's not quite as definitive on each album as I would have liked. I would like more detail on, the, on each album. But, you know, it's a really good read. And then a disappointing one, uh, one that changed my opinion on. So this is a book, uh, Our Band Could Be Your Life, by Michael Azerad, Scenes for the American Indie Underground, 81, 81 to 91. There's about 10 bands focused here. Each one gets their own chapter. I like m m six or seven of the bands, musically. But the problem is, as I say, musicians aren't actually very interesting. Um, and it actually put me off a couple of the bands, well, not put me off because I still listen to their music, but lowered my opinion and my estimation of them as human beings. So that, that was not a great success, that book, unfortunately. Um, four, must you always know who the person is uh, before picking up their life story? No, not at all. In fact, I'm more likely to pick up a book if I don't know who they are because it's not a book necessarily uh, fronted by their ego. Now... You know, any writer, might, especially if they're writing about themselves, ego is going to be on display. But I think if they're a famous person, they're taking their fame egotistically for granted and making sure that that is up front and central at all time. Whereas if it's unknowns, as the two I'm going to talk about are, um, it's not about promoting their ego, even though ego inevitably comes into it. I'm not saying that. So, um, two books. Jack Henry Abbott in The Belly of the Beast. And what a wonderful book this is. So Jack Henry Abbott was uh, a criminal uh, in the 60s. He was in jail. And because he basically was uncontrollable, he was in uh, solitary confinement a lot. And eventually uh, people campaigned for him to get out. Uh, he was released and promptly went and murdered somebody else in a drunken bar brawl and ended back in prison. But that's not really what's interesting about this book. What's interesting is he that he's describing the physicality of what it's like to be in prison, particularly in solitary confinement, where all you have is the light is either on 24 hours or it's off, so you're in darkness, and there's only a hole in the floor uh, for you to make your toilet. And how that hole fills up and encroaches on him and cuts down his space. And it's supremely well written about the physicality of what that what that looked like so this is a superb book even though he's an utterly reprehensible character but i've never heard of him i mean i just came across a reference to this book because i was reading a lot about uh, deviancy and criminality in in, the, in america in the 60s for something i was writing saw a reference to this wow so uh this is uh Free Fall, A Sniper's Story from Chechenia by Nikolai Lilin. It's his second book. He was drafted, conscripted into the Russian army during the Chechen Wars. He was in a, a sort of a secret unit of snipers. And it's, although it starts off in a sort of Kafka-esque way about how he was um, conscripted, 
It was sort of this sort of mad Kafkaesque bureaucracy. After that, there's very little ego in here, other than the ego of wanting to stay alive in a brutal, brutal war. And he just talks about this, you know, what he was involved with in, in the brutality and the inhuman behaviour, what he saw from the other side. And it's done without ego, really, as I say, other than the ego of wanting to stay alive. And it's just a brutal reportage on that war, which is a brutal war. So I'd never heard of this guy. This is so good. I then went back to his earlier novel, uh, sorry, biography called A Siberian Education, which I will come to in another prompt. Five. Have you ever met someone whose biography or autobiography you've read? Yes, I have. Although at the time, this biography, I don't, know, I don't, I don't even know if it had been written. So I hadn't. When I met him, I hadn't read the book, and that is the Radio One music uh, DJ called John Peel, who ruled the airways from the sixties through to his death in the early two thousands. And the book by David Cavanagh, which is called. Good Night and Good Riddance, How 35 Years of John Peel Helped Shape Modern Life. That is the book of my life, because I grew up listening to John Peel at night. He had the late night slot between 10 and 12. I got a lot of my music from him. I remember I went to see this American band called The Gun Club, simply because John Peel mentioned on his show that my then favourite band, The Fall, who were English, the, uh, the lead singer of The Fall really liked this band, The Gun Club. So it was that sort of central to my life and the way the book is written uh, each each sort of day that it looks at it lists uh, John Peel's track list for this show for the evening it lists a news event that happened in that year and then it talks about you know the st what's happening in Peel's life and in, ra in BBC radio and all that sort of stuff it's brilliant and it absolutely brought my own life sort of childhood and, and teens and and early 20s back to me and I was working in a record shop and uh, an independent record shop and John Peel came in to order some records he looked incredibly dapper all in black rings on all his fingers and uh, one of my colleagues um, his wife was was pregnant and was was overdue it wasn't her first child and he leaned over to the Countess John Peel says would you dedicate something play something tonight dedicate it to my right wife um, to sort of induce labour and, and Peel said yes yeah, sure and that night he played Napalm Death which is uh, sort of death thrash metal to induce labour. That He had a very good sense of humour and tragically he died when he was trekking in Peru uh, which has always made me sort of wonder about sort of you know overdoing it really in a sort of physical way which is why I don't play sport anymore having reached my 50s even though I probably should and I don't, I mean, I don't really do any activity. Uh, somewhere, things like that have sort of lodged in my brain and, 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 and sent out a red flag to me. Um, six, what do you think about books that are described as semi-autobiographical? Autobiographical? Autobiographical? Um, I don't really have any opinion on it. I, you know, no one's described a book to me as semi-autobiographical. I mean, that Annie Erno, it's more like autofiction, I suppose. Um, or a book like this, Reality Hunger by David Shields, which I've read twice. The first time I read it, I thought it was non-fiction. And then I read it again last year, no, two years ago. And I realised, no, this is fiction. A bit like the Erno thing. It's sort of auto-fiction. It's basically a very epigrammatic style writing on the type of books that Shields likes to read and likes to write and... You know, they've got to be tied in, in his mind, they've got to be tied into into real world activities and stuff. And yet he'll also cite sort of writers like David Marks. But I actually picked up quite a few uh, book recommendations from this, including Speedboat by Renata Adler, um, Palinarus, uh, which is the pen name of Cyril Connolly, uh, his book The Unquiet Grave, something like that. Uh, uh, Lemontov, uh, something of a hero, which I haven't read yet. So this, you know, this <laughs> is this semi-autobiographical. Is it fiction? Is it is it non-fiction? Who knows? I loved it. Um, I think all fiction, anyway, is is autobiographical. I don't care what anyone says because a writer cannot write out of their beyond their own experience, and even if it's only something they've researched and read about or someone else has told them. It's become part of their experience, admittedly not lived experience, but it's become part of their experience because they've deemed it 
important enough to their sort of mental makeup to remember it and then to rework it and use it in their own writing. So I don't believe, I don't believe there is, you know, the semi-autobiographical, autobiographical, why can't I say that word? Because it doesn't have any meaning, that's why. Um, back to Nikolai Lilin. Now, I don't have this, I think it's the come to my mould outbreak. So his first novel was called My Siberian Education and was very exotic about the strange sort of world of the criminal underworld of Siberia that he grew up in and it's very much sort of passed down from father to son the sort of anti-authoritarian uh, attitude uh, of these gangsters and stuff um, but there was a lot of criticism about it that there were bits that were made up and bits were moved from different geographical locations in his life to other bits to suit the story and stuff which may or may not be true I don't care it was a great read that's all I cared about and I, I got an insight into a world I was not familiar with um, how true is it? Well, does it matter? Because unless I'm going to write about it, which I'm not, I got a picture. Uh, now, whether that's entirely non-fiction or whether it's partly non-fiction and partly fiction or whether it's even all fiction, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't matter. Unless I was going to use it in some way, be it artistic or academic, which, I'm, as I say, I'm not, it doesn't really matter to me. So, yeah. Um, seven, give an example of a life story that really surprised you. Well, I can't say really surprised you. What surprised me was how it chimed with me, a bit like the John Peel book, although I knew that word because that was so much of my life. This is Paul Morley, nothing. Paul Morley started life as a, a music journalist and being inside the industry, uh, he, he saw how to manipulate it. And he formed Frankie Goes to Hollywood with the express purpose of, I'm going to form a band that's going to go to number one because I know how to. And sure enough, he did, and they did, and they went to number one. And he's always been a bit of a sort of pseudo-intellectual in his music writing, sort of throwing in terms and writers, and you think, you don't need that, Paul. So he's always been a bit up himself. But this book had two sort of fundamental aspects to it. The first was, because he's from Manchester, he was very close at the time to the band Joy Division, who were from Manchester in the late 70s, early, early 80s, when the lead singer hung himself in 1980 and the band then went on to become New Order. And Morley asks himself, why was he more obsessed and concerned about the death of Ian Curtis, who's the lead singer, than the death of his own father, who, died, who also committed suicide, um, and died around the same time, maybe slightly before, which is a really interesting question because it's something I could relate to. My father tried to commit suicide, I didn't actually succeed and carried on living for a good 20 years after. Um, but I had the same question. I was less, I was less concerned in investigating his, his attempted suicide than I was in Ian Curtis's. Now it's true, maybe it was too too close to home, too emotional. I don't think those are the reasons. I think like Morley, it's all about, you know, who you're really identifying with, a sort of cultural person who's making music you're into versus your own father, who's a different generation and different values and different interests and stuff. So that was the first thing that surprised me that, ah, there's someone else who also felt that. The second is he has a facial palsy uh, in his forties uh, so one of the side of his face drops and it sort of has to be sort of re reconstructed and rebuilt up. And that sort of punctured the balloon of Morley's pomposity. I mean, some of the writing in here is still quite pompous, but the mere fact that he's dealing with a sort of a facial disfigurement that, that befell him burst some of that pomposity in himself. So, yeah, that was uh, somewhat surprising. What biographies, autobiographies, memoirs are currently on your TBR? None. Uh, nine. Whose life story did you find particularly hard going, either emotionally difficult to read or very boring? I'm afraid all of these are musicians, because as I say, musicians can't write. So this is Kim Gordon, girl in a band. Uh, Kim Gordon was the bassist and one of the singers in Sonic Youth, one of my favourite noise art noise bands. She is an artist as well as a musician. Uh, but she is very, very reluctant to reveal herself and proved quite frustrating. So that was not a great book. And back to the band Joy Division, my favourite band, I have to say. 
this is by Peter Hook. This is called Unknown Pleasures Inside Joy Division because he was the bass guitarist. So you think if anyone would know the skinny, it would be this guy. And he does know the skinny, but boy, is it boring. Now, admittedly, I know a lot about Joy Division. My first ever piece of creative writing was a one-man play on about a Joy Division fan five years after Ian Curtis's suicide, and this fan has not been able to move on. And I did an awful lot of research in the music papers for the three years that Joy Division were around. I literally went to my university library after I'd finished my exams and just <laughs> demanded all these music papers that they had. And I just, you know, went through them religiously for any snippet on Joy Division, and that's where my play came from. Um, so I knew a lot about it before, and the point is this added nothing, despite the fact the geezer was in the band. But having said that, his follow-up book was called The Hacienda, How Not to Run a Club, because when Joy Division transmuted into New Order, uh, they also became quite wealthy, because New Order sold a lot of records. And one of the things they did was they, they bought a nightclub for dance music. And this is a very good uh, insight into what a mad world it was, because they're musicians, they're not businessmen. So they didn't know how to run it properly. It was getting so successful at the height of dance music that gangsters came in to do their business there. Obviously, there was lots of drug dealing and stuff, and it got quite scary at times. In the end, it closed down. But this is, this is a very good book about those times. So 1978 to 1980, boring. Uh, whenever this is, was it the 80s or the 90s? I don't know. I'm not into dance music. Far more pleasing. Um, this... Christopher Hitchens, Mortality, written while he's in hospital suffering from terminal cancer and having one last shot at, at treatment. And death is a subject I'm absolutely obsessed with. Uh, I haven't read any other Hitchens, but I, I respect his ability, his brain. I've seen him in talk on videos and stuff. I, expect, I respect him as a writer. And I got nothing out of this. And the only mitigation I'll give him is the guy was dying. So maybe he wasn't on top of his writing form. But this didn't do anything for me, I'm afraid. Um, and um, another one. Uh, I don't have it. Uh, again, on, on Ian Curtis, uh, the Joy Division guy, uh, written by his wife uh, with, a, with another writer. So you'd think if anyone knew the skinny and the scoop on Ian Curtis's mental state, and part of why he committed suicide is he was in an affair uh, and felt very guilty towards his wife and his very young daughter. Um, but you'd think if anyone knew the skinny, it would be his wife. Uh, but just so boring. Um, you know, she, she's not a writer, ultimately, and she has very few insights to share, or that she's able to share. Now, whether that's because she's reined herself in, because she feels it a betrayal of trust to talk about these things, I don't know. But it was dull as ditch water. And finally, uh, a book I found incredibly offensive. I've, I read it on, on Kindle on my laptop, so I don't have it to share. And it was, called, it was by a, a stand-up comedian called... Um, Ian Stone, who was a working class Jewish guy from North London, so I understood the media very much in which he came from. And he had two obsessions in his life as a child, while his parents' marriage was falling, up, falling apart all around him in sort of screaming matches. And those two obsessions were football and music. And the book is ostensibly him following the band The Jam uh, all around the country. Now, I, I was a big fan of the jam, but I didn't travel all around the country like he did. He was used to it because he'd been doing it for football, and I respect him for that, because at age 14, travelling up and down the country on trains to follow your football team in the 80s was dangerous, very dangerous, because of football hooligan violence. And I was expecting to get a lot of insight into the jam, but actually... Uh, there's very little about him sort of following the jam, and it's mainly him being him being paying off old scores with teachers and schoolmates and stuff. He's so nasty towards them. I I just it was a hateful hateful book, and I will again I'll put a link to my review of it. Um, ten. Is there anyone you know personally who you feel should have their story written down? Uh, not really. Uh, especially me. Uh, if I if I did make it uh, to whatever level as a, as a writer of fiction, um, if anyone wanted to write my biography and approach me for it, I'd say, well, there's there's no story to tell. I mean, all my I, as I said, you know, writing is autobiographical, biographical, but I. 
I so stretch and work the material because I'm obsessed with form, literary form, novelistic form. That is always my focus. That, that any, uh, any sort of source material for my life gets absolutely mutated by my treatment of it to become unrecognisable in the, you know, from, from me uh, in my life. Although it'll be interesting, because my new novel, Stories We Tell Our Children, has 30 short stories making up the novel, um, I think there's about eight of them based on stuff I've directly pulled from my life. But I think it's interesting that 32, the other 30, uh, sorry, 22, are drawn from my imagination. Yes, there must have been seeds I'm drawing on that I've observed or whatever. Um, but it'll be interesting that some of those eight stories drawn from my own life, they might be a little closer to home and more recognisable for certain people in my life than my previous writing. So I'm just going to have to see how people react, people I know react to that. Um, Eleven, have you read any diaries or collections of letters? If so, which ones do you find interesting? I haven't read any diaries, I don't think. Uh, yeah, letter collections. So Letters from Prison, uh, Prison by Antonio Gramsci. Gramsci was the only Marxist worth reading, in my opinion, because he reintroduced the cultural and human aspect back into uh, Marxism, which otherwise supposedly ran on sort of scientific laws of history. Um, but, you know, this is a mixture of, yes, you get some of his, poli his political theories, but actually it's very tender letters back to his wife. He was in one of Mussolini's prisons and died there in the end. Uh, I've read Franz Kafka's Letters to Milena, which was a buddy read with Lukács at um, a, cruel a Cruel Reader's Thesis channel. And that was great, because I've read all of Kafka's fiction now. Um, and it was, it, was, it was an insight to, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the fiction that he produced was because that's what his life was. As I say, he was very much an outlier. He was sort of very neurotic. And these letters to Milena, so they're having this sort of romantic relationship in their heads. And she's as bad as he is. And she's in Vienna, he's in Prague or in a sanatorium in the Czech countryside. And they're forever making these plans of trains to come and meet up with each other. And, and more often than not, they just, they, they don't get on the trains. You know, it's, it's so neurotic. Um, it's brilliant. But, you know, you see things like his remarks about sort of bugs and insects in his room which, of course, he wrote a lot about uh, animals as protagonists in his short stories, The Metamorphosis and stuff. So I found those very enlightening. And the other book, uh, which I don't have, I wonder if it's a come to my mould outbreak. I'm a, bit, I'm a bit saddened and chastened if it had. I wasn't aware I didn't have it, or at least I can't find it. And that is George Jackson, Letters from a Soledad Brother. So George Jackson was a, a black power activist who was imprisoned in Soledad Prison and educated himself, uh, read lots of Marx and sort of revolutionary theory, and was killed in a prison riot in Soledad, which is in very dubious circumstances. But these letters are brilliant. If you're interested in the 60s and American politics, and particularly black power politics, it's a really good read. Um, OK, and finally, uh, what are a few life story books you would recommend us to read? Well, uh, I'm going back to Nikolai Lillian, because if you have any interest in modern war, and if you've read lots of books about Vietnam, go and read this, because this is an entirely different type of war to what Vietnam was. Uh, another book is An Evil Cradling by Brian Keenan. Brian Keenan was one of the um, hostages who was kidnapped in uh, Beirut during the Civil War there, and like Terry Waite, was sort of chained to a radiator. And a bit like Jack Henry Abbott... Um, in the belly of the beast, that sort of that physicality of having a very, very narrow sort of ambit of in which you can move and you're sort of tethered and you can't move and how, you know, the relationship of the guards. I remember one of the things in this book, he talked about the guards, these sort of, you know, uh, uh, Islamic fundamentalists, they were absolutely obsessed with watching Ar Arnold Schwarzenegger movies and they loved, you know, which seems to be dichotomous, but they shouldn't, but because of the sort of the ultra violence, the ultra masculinity of them. They were totally into it. So th this was a really good book I recommend. And the final one, which is in my shed, um, I just forgot to get it out, is uh, Jeanette Winterson's Why Be Normal? Uh, if No, Why Be Happy When You Could Be Normal? Which is, I haven't read Oranges of the Only Fruit, uh, which it seems to be fairly autobiographical. But this is her second, and this is, a, this is avowedly non-fiction. And it's when she's just, you know, she's, she knew she was adopted, 
and this is a book about her sort of going in search of her uh, adopted uh, her, her birth mother and it's the story of that and, and you know the difficult sort of emotional things involved in that uh, her partner is a, is a psychotherapist which is kind of feeds into the book as well because she's always talking with her partner about the things that are thrown out by trying to get on the trail of her birth mother and stuff it's a really it's and again like the light orange is not the only fruit it talks a lot about her adoptive mother who's completely gaga on this sort of you know uh, strange religion uh, version of christianity that that winterson rebelled against uh it's a great read i mean winston is such a great writer so there you have it uh surprisingly for someone who doesn't read autobiographies and memoirs and biographies a very long video so thanks to mark at um uh, book time with Elvis. Uh, till next time.